Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. A couple of announcements before we get started. Um, registration for Suko is now closed. Um, those that are coming to Torah to the Tribe Sukkot here in Oregon um, will all receive, those that are registered will receive an email um, requiring you to complete a friendly survey about um, meals, kosher meals, and confirmation of your site registration. So watch your inboxes over the next couple of days if you registered for Sukkot. Today, I'm going to do a little bit of a topical teaching for you. Um, just really feel with the times pressing. So many people have contacted me and the ministry, I think, over the past few months, especially in light of the date that it is next Shabbat. Is it September the 23rd? And there is uh, all kinds of constellation alignments. And if we open our scriptures to Revelation 12. It is truly, truly an amazing time. And those of you that have studied this, I know Larry here has brought um, much information, and you can talk to Larry here at the assembly, or if you're coming to Oregon Sioux Coat, make sure that you rugby tackle Larry, and he's got all of the star charts on his laptop, and there's a wealth of information. This is an astronomical fact, is it not, Larry? It is. This isn't speculation. The alignment of Revelation 12 is happening. What does that mean? Well, that's an, that's an answer that I don't have. But what it shows me is that we live in amazing, amazing times. So in light of that next week, in light of the questions that people have asked me personally, we've received in emails, it just inspired me to bring forth a message that I hope brings the simplicity and the seriousness of where we stand and the position that we take in light of the days that we live in. So without further ado, why don't you turn to Second Thessalonians because there is such despair parity today within what we like to call Christianity. Never before has there been such disparity within Christianity. Now, if reform theology, like Wesleyan reform theology, is the middle ground, the balanced area, then on one end of the spectrum, you've got the evangelical Christians, and Christian Zionism. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you've got the Messianic movement and the Hebrew Roots movement. And with that, you're getting such a seesaw, but ultimately they're both heading in the same destructive direction when it comes to the theology on the last days, Israel, the temple, and animal sacrifices. And what we're finding with the days and times that we're living in, that no longer is Reformed theology the balance but we're seeing this disparity which is becoming more and more explosive, more volatile as the days far approach. So I want to put us back into balance because I believe whether it's Christian Zionism on one end of the spectrum or the Hebrew roots and the Messianics on the other end of the spectrum of Christianity, because the balance now has shifted, are so, so volatile in their relation to the temple and are looking at it in a carnal, fleshly manner. Because there is nothing more fleshly than animals being slaughtered, slit, and bled, and men geographically walking to a geographical location, if you will, to perform a religious rite and ceremony. I want to show us 
what has already been shown by the pattern or tevinah, the pattern that was given to Moses. Because Yahuwah always had what Paul the Apostle said, that you are what? A, the temple of the living Elohim. So let's turn to Second Thessalonians because this scripture, I believe, is something that we can see regarding the future days that we live in, the great apostasy. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our master, Yahushua, the Messiah, and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled. So we have to have a renewing of our mind daily through prayer, through word, and reading the word and the meditation in the word. So oftentimes, I found, quite honestly, 10 years in the Messianic movement, it is oppressive, depressing, and extremely, extremely new saturated in an apocalyptic literature and an outlook on life that you actually become very changed in the way that you deal with life and act as a believer. I am so much more inspired today in the Malkitetic priesthood because I have come back to that first love just as inspired as I was in my early 20s when I first got saved. I went through a desert of theology, oppressive, depressive, apocalyptic, messianic thinking for a decade where my knowledge increased and my love for people decreased. I am so glad that I got delivered from a religious rote and be able to take that experience with me and now deliver inspiration through the Word and the Holy Spirit to people as I'm inspired by people more and more and more. We've like gone full circle but taken the understanding with us. Just like the Apostle Paul went full circle and took his understanding. That's growth, is it not? Look what it says. We are to renew our minds daily because we're not to be troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if it is from us, as though the day of Messiah had come. There is no secret rapture next Shabbat, okay? So let's not even get into that. But that is the disparity because evangelical Christianity and Christian Zionism on one end, they're all supportive of Israel, all supportive of a temple mount, all supportive of Zionism, but they expect what? The secret rapture. On the other end of the spectrum, you've got the Messianic Hebrew Roots Movement that are all supported of Israel, are total Zionists, but they know there is no secret rapture. But they're still both trekking towards the same geographical and apocalyptic destructive scenario of apostasy and deception. So now we can continue on and it says, let no one deceive you by any means for the day will not come unless there is a great falling away first. The man of sin is revealed the son of perdition. And I'm not going to speculate on who that is. There's been enough speculation for thousands and thousands of years without me adding to it. But those who oppose and the son of a perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all is called Elohim or that is worship so that he sits as Elohim in the sanctuary that's the general geographic vicinity of the temple mount we know the temple mount is south of the southern steps down in the city of David. It's not actually the Anatonia Fortress, which the Jews today, the Khazarians that aren't even Jews, say that it's the Temple Mount. We know there's a, there's a lot going on right there within that sentence. Dig into that further. There is a conspiracy and a great apostasy because this is multi-level deception that people are caught up in on both ends of the spectrum of what used to be called Christianity. So let us continue further on, and we will see in verse 5, 
Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things, and now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time? For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the Torahless one, the lawless one, will be revealed, whom the master will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one or Torahless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs and lying wonders. So we can see as we are revealed throughout the scripture, at some time there's going to be some event. Now, people have asked me, is it next week? Is it with the alignment of these um, astronomical events that appear to be Revelation 12? Is this going to be when the Holy Spirit, Matthew, is taken out of the way, no longer restraining, that Yahweh's mercy is no longer going to be on a society that hates him? And then is that when it's going to happen? Is that when it's going to happen? Larry, is it? Come up here, Larry. Larry's looking nervous right now. <laughs> that was a great one, wasn't it? Is that? He doesn't want to answer that question any more than I do. But we have got to see the signs, and we see the signs are coming. But the technology today, whether it's the new iPhone with its facial recognition, anybody come back into America through passport control recently? I have. It's facial recognition technology. Try to get into Great Britain nowadays. You don't even have to go to passport control where a man is. Just get your passport in there and let them scan your face and you're in. So we are in that society of technological advancement now where with the new iPhone, you don't have to tap in a code. You don't even have to put your fingerprint in there now. It's facial recognition technology. So that means if you get arrested, heaven forbid, all the policeman has to do is knock you out and hold your phone up to your face while you're down, and they've got access breaking all of your rights to your secure, no longer secure information. And all of these devices talk to one another. This is the days that we live in. Can you see how the apostasy and the great deception and the whole world will see when the two witnesses are slain and it's projected on YouTube, on your devices, live streaming. I mean, 200 years ago, 100 years ago, 50 years ago, you had to imagine this. Now you see it happening all the time. So should we be looking for carnality or should we be set right and balanced like we were supposed to be from the beginning, instead of being fleshly and carnal in relation to a temple, because this great apostasy is all regarding surrounding what? We just read it. A satanic, luciferic deception regarding theology, geography and spiritual depravity around the sanctuary and temple. So we had better get our geography, geology and geographic spirituality set not on earthly things by renewing of our mind back to the former things, declaring the former things, says the prophet, so that we can be secure in the steps that we take today. Because regardless of what happens next Shabbat, regardless of what happens on September the 23rd, astronomically, there is an alignment in the heavens that does bear witness to the Bible. The Bible Revelation chapter 12. This isn't something that happens like the blood moons all the time that people mark it and capitalize on. This is real. How are we to deal with the real?
So, turn with me to Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. Will a man rob Yahweh? You have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and in offerings. You are cursed with a curse. Yahweh wants us to give. He wants us to save. And then, when? Then he wants us to live. How many of us are doing that? Yahweh doesn't need your money. Yahweh wants your what? What does he want? He wants your heart. He doesn't want your money. He wants your heart. Why are you robbing him? You save and you live and then you give. But you're supposed to give. You're supposed to save. And then you're supposed to live. Why is it that we don't do the things that the Father asks of us? Because he says we're into robbery. We're into robbery. Luke chapter 12, verse 33, Yahuwah doesn't want your money. Sell thee what ye have and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. What do you spend your time thinking about? What is it that drives you? Where are you putting your money? Because that's where your heart is. This isn't a message on tithing. This is a message on us being spiritually right and prepared for the days and times that we live in. But it is connected to our hearts, is it not? He wants us to be like this so that he can pour into us. Pour into us. You see, disease is a curse. It's not a blessing. Disease is a curse. It's not a blessing. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, there is the list of blessings. Where there's blessings, there is no disease. He wants us to live a blessed life. And sometimes what we're doing or what has capitulated into our life and what is now blocking our hearts causes disease. In Exodus chapter, chapter 25 verse 1, this is written, And Yahuwah spoke to Moshe saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they may bring me an offering of every man that gives willingly with his so tithing is directly connected with what? Your wallet. No. Your bank account. No. Tithing is directly connected with your heart, and that's spiritual health. And he doesn't want us to be diseased. In our minds, in our bodies, in our spirits. And he wants us to be liberated. In Exodus chapter 26 verse 1. Moreover, you shall make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine twined linen and blue and purple and scarlet. And the cherubim of skilled work shall you make them. This is talking about the tabernacle. But in 1 Corinthians, we all know the verse, chapter 3, verse 16. Know you not that you are the tabernacle, you are the temple of Yahuwah, and what dwells in you? The Ruach, the Ruach, the Spirit of Yahuwah dwells in you. He wants access, full access to your heart, because that is where he wants to put the treasure. 
And that treasure is blessing. That treasure is enlightenment and vision in a dying and diseased world that you and I live in. And it's getting worse and worse, isn't it? Every week that I go back into that work world, I am astounded more and more and more at the scary things that are happening out there. Yahuwah Ropecha. Yahuwah is our healer, and we need him every day, every moment, all the time, don't we? Exodus chapter 15, verse 26. Listen to the voice of Yahweh your Elohim and will do that which is right in his sight and will give ear to his what? His commandments. We're going to give ear to his commandments and guard all his statutes. I will put none of these diseases upon you which I have brought upon the world. I mean vaccinations, fluoride in the water, chemtrails, GMOs, the wheat that we have in our bread. It's not the wheat that we had in the 20s. I mean, my goodness, we're supposed to be entering into the land flowing of milk and honey. We've got lactose intolerance. We've got bees that are dying off in swarms. We've got birds falling out the blooming air. I mean, it, it, what is going on? And when you question any of this, you're the lunatics. And when you ask the doctor, can you give me the insert that's in that vaccination? Oh, oh, because oh. they don't read it. And they have to go scurrying around the office to try and find the insert. The medical data sheet, which has got all the, this is going to kill you. You're going to have, you know, I mean, have you, I mean, these adverts. And it's got all these noodles jogging in their Nikes along a trail and embracing in the mist in their 70s. And then afterwards, you're going to have erectile dysfunction and your liver's going to fall out and you're going to have diarrhea. And you're like, oh, well, why didn't they show that? Why didn't they have a guy jogging along? Right, right, you know, give me a break. And people are buying this stuff. Oh, yeah, sign me up for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. And we're the lunatics. Because the masses are in Egypt and they are diseased. They are diseased and cursed. And they love it. They love the garlic, they love the onions, they love the idolatry. It's all around them and there's a mass and everybody's cheering one another on. And you and I, we've crossed through the Red Sea because we've been baptized, we've been mikvahed, immersed into Yahushua and we're looking back and we're like, no, they're the lunatics in the asylum and we've broken out. Praise Yah. But we've got to leave that stuff behind and not start to drag it with us. We've got to come unentangled from that and renew our minds daily by the word and prayer and by being together. You lot inspire me. Why would you not want to come together at the feasts and the Shabbats? Travel great distances to do it because we inspire each other because we've all made decisions to leave Egypt, leave that thinking behind and be renewed as a new one, new man. So I want to share this because I want to talk about biblical health because in the Bible, in the Hebrew text, there are names for about 80 different body parts. 80 different body parts. There's all kinds of Hebrew names for it. But do you know that there is not one single Hebrew word for the whole body as we think of it today? What's up with that? There is not one single Hebrew word for the whole encompassing body, body, as we think of it today. 
Why? Why is that? Because the word that comes to the closest that we have today to meaning a physical body is this word. It's the Hebrew word geviyah, which occurs 13 times in the Old Testament. That's the closest word to the human body as a whole. It's not even that close, but it's the closest word to the human body as a whole. On eight occasions, it refers to a dead body. That ain't good. That's not the kind of whole body that I want, right? Or you want. On three occasions, it refers to a body in a vision or a dream, something mystical. And only on two occasions does it refer to a living body, but we can see from the screen, these are victims of starvation and disease. So what is the Father trying to communicate to us by the absence of what we would expect today as well? Oh, the Bible's all about people, right? Well, surely there's a word that talks about the body as a whole. Because isn't that what drives our society today? Isn't it? Going to put your body in a fancy car. Going to put your body in a fancy house. We're going to fill your body with vaccines, toxins, GMOs to try and liquidate you. Then we're going to, if you still survive, we're going to put your body in a FEMA camp. Or maybe we'll monetize your body and put it in prison, give you double life sentences and double this so we can double monetize it. The whole world is about bodies. It's about body image, diet this, eat that, dress in this, is it not? But to Yahweh, that isn't important. Because there is something far more important than the way that we have been trained to think in this sick and twisted world that we live in. We are literally thinking like lunatics if we believe the health propaganda that they are funneling at us through Western medicine, through media, and through all of that hypocrisy. We will end up starving in a FEMA camp or diseased from vaccines, GMOs, and all of the chemtrails, unless we pull our heads out of Egypt, out of the sand, and get into the land where we're not going to have lactose intolerance, because we're going to be having date honey, and we're going to be having milk, which is from where? It's going to be supplied to us because we are going to be walking the way the Ruach, the Spirit, calls us to walk. So as we progress through, I want us to re-examine the scriptures, the body, and the temple in light of what Yahweh's word says. Because I don't want to live around and see dead bodies, bodies that are full of starvation, sickness, and disease, because that's what you see when you see geviyah within the scripture, that Hebrew word in Genesis chapter 47, verse 18, in Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 37. These are the potential victims of starvation and slavery. That's not a good example for us. This is hugely significant to me when I'm looking in the word, because the virtual absence of the word body in the Old Testament shows me what? What does it show me and what does it show you? That health, according to Yahuwah, is not primarily limited to your casing. That's not where health is. But that's what our world teaches us, right? But no, that will lead to starvation, disease, and famine. Because Yahweh says, no, health is not presented primarily in physical terms, unlike today. No, the Bible doesn't define health by limiting it to our bodies. 
Because, think about it, if the desire, if the desire for well-being is confined to the body, then the result is likely not health, but ill health. And that, does, that doesn't mean that you've got to be an occultist like Hillary Clinton and get on national television and tell us that you sit on a yoga mat from Subway. They used to put that in the Subway bread, by the way, and do um, alternate nostril breathing. Did you hear about that? That's her latest fad. I mean, what a luciferic lizard. I mean, my goodness. Really, I, re I mean, she's talking about her. That's how... Wow. Anyway, stay on subject. But that woman literally, Second Thessalonians right there, potentially. I mean, my goodness. But in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament, full biblical health, the word for it, simple. We all know it so well. Shalom. Shalom. That means the presence of wholeness. The presence of wholeness. It's completeness. It's well-being. It is something that happens to infiltrate all spheres of our life, whether it's physical, whether it's mental, whether it's spiritual, it's individual but it's also social and it is national. That's why Yahuwah has the Sabbaths and the feasts and the dietary requirements for us because these are the building blocks that lead you into physical, mental, spiritual, individual, social, gathering at the Sabbaths and the feasts, and national, you are the children of Elohim. He is giving us a rope and pulling us out of the pagan nations. Will you grab hold of it? Because this is how we learn to walk in true biblical health. Yahuwah Shalom in Judges chapter 6 verse 24. Yahuwah Shalom. Now, in the New Testament, when Yahusha, Yahusha healed people, there was the Greek word that's used, hujis. And in the Septuagint, hujis is used to translate the Hebrew word shalom. So the Greek word, another Greek word, Irene, is used in the New Testament in terms of harmony and wholeness in regard to relationships. And this Greek word is used in the Septuagint again to translate the word shalom. Even the Greek word soteria, which comes from the verb sozo, which is where we get our English word, well, you're saved, aren't you? Are you saved? I'm saved. Are you saved? Are we saved? Are we saved? Salvation. Everyone's talking about salvation. But do you have shalom? How about a little bit of Shabbat shalom? Well, I'm not doing any of that Shabbat Shalom business. Well, do you want full spiritual biblical health? Because that's part of it. You have a Shabbat. You rest. This is a rope, a building block to pull you out of secular humanism that you've built up all around your religious institutions. Yahweh's pulling us out. He's using the Sabbaths, the feasts, and the dietary requirements to do it because those are such big building blocks that we can actually, in our stiff nakedness, grab a hold of it, right? There's six characteristics of biblical health. Number one, simply well-being. Number two, it's righteousness. The Hebrew word there, of course, zadachah, connected to the zadik, malki, zadik. The third, obedience. Obedience is better than animal sacrifices. Strength. Fertility. And, of course, longevity. 
rise in the presence of the gray hair. I'm getting a lot more gray hair nowadays. I must say, my goodness. But shalom, health is intricately connected to the secrets of the holy of holies. In the Hebrew, kedosh ha kedoshim. Health is intricately connected to Solomon's temple. And at this point, I want to refer back to a teaching from the late 90s. We'll give you the website because I'm just going to do an abridged version today. Be kind of short, but we want to refer you to... Um, some work by this guy. He came, when, when you guys were still hanging your Christmas lights, there was a gentleman called Tony Badillo in the late 90s that did this work about the temple and how it connects to the body all the way from the beginning. In fact, we have that website so you can do a dig down and do a deep dive. It's templesecrets.info. And you can go there and, and read along or you can stick with me here. But do a little bit of more deep diving because when you were still hanging your Christmas lights, Tony was going in and really bringing forth that you are the temple of the living, living Elohim. Because the temple was designed in the form of a body. All the way from the beginning. It was designed from the point of view of a body. Because Yahweh knows the end from the beginning. And if you destroy this temple within three days, I will raise it up, says the master. You see, the body of the man who is Jacob, Jacob who is Israel, and the high priest and the king Messiah himself, Yahusha, this is talking about the threefold man. Because ultimately the temple, the true temple, which is you, is connected to health and to healing. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 28 and verse 4. And Jacob went out from Beersheba and he went toward Haran and he came upon a certain place and he stayed there all night because the sun was set and he took the stones of that place so now we're into a building, building stones. You are lively stones, living stones. That's the end from the beginning. But this is where the temple began, right here, because this is going to be, we're going to find, this is the location of what would become the temple in Jerusalem. This is the location of the Holy of Holies because we are going to find a gate that connects the earth to the heavens. That is the Kadosh HaKedoshim in the Hebrew, the Holy of Holies. Now, even the ancient rabbis will take that a step further and take this all the way back to the midst of the garden where man was formed out of the dust. So the dust from the Holy of Holies, the very inner part of the sanctuary, is actually the very midst of the garden. And this all connects back to Jerusalem. But it's bigger than that because we're going to see this temple man vision really has always been about the end goal, which is lively, living, living stones. Jacob now went out from Beersheba in Genesis chapter 28, verse 10. He went towards Haran and he came upon a certain place and he stayed there all night because the sun was set. And he took the stones of that place and they used him for his pillows. My wife, she has a couple of pillows and they literally are like stones. My goodness. She gets them from her therapeutic massage therapist and... I mean, if I were to lay on those things, I would be walking around like this. But when she lays on them, she's just like got, you know, standing up upright. So, I mean, that's just a, a, just a testament to your, your holiness and how Yahweh is using you mightily in the visions of Jacob. And he dreamed and he saw a ladder set upon the earth and the top of it reached to the very, very heavens. And see, the heavenly angels of Elohim were ascending and descending on it or beside him, the Messiah, 
And we know that because Yahushua goes back to this, does he not, in the New Testament. You see, Yahushua is what enables the angels and us men to come from the earthly realm and get into the heavenly realm. He is the ladder. We are ascending and descending from the very beginning, even in the Hebrew language. Of course, the King Jimmy being monked with by, not the monks, but the Masorite scribes, the Masoretic text, changes Genesis chapter 28, verse 12. Have a look at it in the Septuagint. You'll get a better translation. And verse 13, and see, Yahweh stood above it and said, I am Yahweh Elohim of Abraham, your father, and Elohim of Jacob, the land where you lie. To you will I give it to you and to your seed and your seed shall be as the dust of the earth and you shall break out abroad to London England to Salem Oregon you're going to be all over the place to the east to the west and to the north and to the south and in you and in your seed shall all the families of the earth be mingled or blessed and see I am with you, and I will keep you in all the places where you are going, and I will bring you again into this land, for I will not leave you until I have done that which I have spoken to you. And Jacob, he awoke. He awoke out of his sleep, and he said, Surely Yahweh is in this very place. He's in this very place. And I didn't even know it. Didn't even know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. There is no other place but the house of Elohim. That's what this is. And this is the gate to the very, very heavens. This is the gate to the heavens. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and he took the stone that he had put for his pillow and he set it up for a pillar and he poured oil upon the top of it and he called the name of that place Bethel but the name of that city was first called Luz or almond tree because it connects back to the branch which was taken from the tree of life that then was passed down through the Malkit Zedek that branch broken off this is another teaching Passed down the generations to the firstborn. That's the branch that Joseph had. And it ended up in Rule's garden, the book of Jasher tells us. And Moshe Rabbeinu was the one that was able to pluck it out. It then went into the Ark of the Covenant, that branch that budded, became our Aaron's rod. And then it later tells you that um, David was transporting it, singing on his way up the Mount of Olives as his son Absalom was in pursuit. And then the next thing you know, next time you hear about the Ark of the Covenant and you look inside of that, there is no almond rod in there. Where is it? David had actually planted it or transplanted it up on the Mount of Olives, that branch off of the tree of life, because Absalom was chasing him. He transplanted it on the Mount of Olives, and it grew to be a tree, the very tree on which Messiah, in fact, was crucified, that would give us the access back into the garden. That's a short, abridged version of a very long teaching I've done in the past from memory. But this is the Bible, and it's alive, and it's all right there. It's amazing. Sometimes I inspire myself. Sometimes not. My wife's like, yeah, yeah. Carol got to experience some of that last night, but we already spoke. But that's what happens. Anyway, let's continue on further. What verse was I in? Thank you. Somebody's paying attention. And he called the name of that place Almond. And Yaakov vowed a vow saying, If the word of Elohim will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come again into my father's house in full biblical health. 
Full biblical health is associated with understanding that Jacob is the temple man. And that that stone is going to be translated into a living stones, lively stones, where we are going to be able to access full biblical health, which is the Hebrew word shalom. But first of all, we've got to get out of Egypt, got to get out of the pharmakia and get back into doing Bible things the way Yahuwah wants us from the very Bereshit beginning. And then he goes on to say, and this stone, verse 22, which I have set for a pillar, shall be Yahuwah's house and all of you shall give me, I will surely give that tithe back to you. So tithing again is connected to the temple body, the heart, and full biblical health. You see how I'm tying that in? And again, this isn't a message about your wallet. This is a message about seeing, believing, and moving in true biblical health and being liberated to the things that would hold you back. Liberate. Do not be like those that you see around you. Do not be like the world but be liberated from the things of the world. So let's look at the model. Let's look at the model. Here's the model. And we can see now there's Jacob lying on that pillow, that uncomfortable pillow of stones. Now, if we look closely, we can see that the Holy of Holies relates to the very head of of Jacob. Jacob, who is Israel. Now, the short stairway leading up to the Holy of Holies is like his neck or his throat. There's slight elevation there as if you're on one of those uncomfortable pillows. And the holy place is his body, his torso. Here, the holy place. And the temple's twin pillars Those twin pillars are named Yachin and Boaz. They are his two legs. Can you see that? It's a little hard to see. Some of you may have to take a picture, a screenshot, and blow it up if your eyes aren't too good because you're old. Anyway, now in relation to his arms, hands, and feet, they also appear on the screen. The Holy of Holies is the rock. It's like unto the pillow, slightly elevated. Of course, it would have required a ramp. And that ramp is, of course, Temple Man's throat. Look at Temple Man. Jacob, he was on his way to Mesopotamia to find a wife because he wanted to build a house. He wanted to create a family because that's what it's all about. Jacob's body as he slept right there at Bethel while using a stone for a pillow is in fact the model for Yahweh's house. That's the model that we see come into full view in light of Yahusha. In fact, later on in the book of Ruth, it's written that his two wives, in fact, are the builders of the house of Israel in Ruth chapter 4, verse 11. Because Jacob built a human temple. That was a temple that consisted of all 12 tribes. And these 12 tribes then raised up Solomon's temple, the house of El. So in reality, this very vision, this very dream that Jacob has in the Genesis account is the dream that concerns the building of three houses. The first house is Jacob and his 12 sons. Those 12 tribes then build Solomon's temple, which becomes Yahweh's house, right? And then ultimately, those stones are broken down, and the Messiah, in turn, as the Malkitzedic high priest, brings in living stones, because that wasn't just one stone that Jacob put his head on. That was a grouping of stones. If you look at it in the text, a grouping of stones, most probably 12, I imagine, that he laid his head on. 
He'd got a nice little grouping to make a little pillow. Twelve stones that he made as a pillow. Ultimately, that third temple is brought about by Yahushua as the high priest, making you and I his pillow to rest his head because we're going to find in our day we are coming together as one new temple man under the high priesthood of Yahushua with wealth, health, and spiritual prosperity. Now look at the high priest. Look at the high priest because now you're going to see as you dig deeper into this temple plan that the high priest is in fact the temple man himself. The temple floor plan transforms into the figure of the high priest. In the first instance, number one, look at the priestly cells as the turban on the west side. That's where the gold and silver bullion, First Kings chapter 7 verse 51, was stored. The cells actually form the high priest's head covering. You know that he wore a head covering, right? Exodus chapter 28. Now look at number two, the two large stars. These are the two ten cubit tall cherubs or cherubs of gold plated olive wood from 1 Kings chapter 6. They look like the eyes within temple man's head, don't they? Isn't that amazing? While the head is in fact the Holy of Holies. Now look at the Ark of the Covenant, number three. This is the gold-plated chest with a solid gold cover and two small cherubs. Those are the two small stars. The Ark is his nose. You see the poles. And when attached to its long sides and drawn forward in First Kings chapter 8... Verse 8, this, of course, depicts the nostrils. Not like Hillary, where temple man's doing alternate nostril breathing. No, that would be the ante. That's the ante of this, the unholy ununion with Bill and Hillary. We don't want any of that nonsense. But no, we see right here, these nostrils are extended because they're smelling the sweet, sweet aroma from the incense of altar, whereas Hillary is smelling rotting carcasses from Bohemian Grove, right? See the disparity that's going on in the world that we live in today. My goodness, look at number four, the stairway. Of course, this is a short staircase or a ramp that led up to the holy place, slightly elevated, about six cubits into the Holy of Holies. The stairway is, of course, the neck or throat, and its top is the mouth. Number five on the picture you can see. Didn't Tony do a fabulous job? Amazing. This was when you guys were still hanging Christmas lights. This is late 90s. I'm sure it's late 90s, early 2000s type of thing. I remember studying this, oh, at least a decade ago. I mean, amazing. I mean, amazing stuff. Anyway, look at the incense altar, number five. This small gold-plated altar, 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 22, is national Israel's heart. It's the sweet-smelling smoke, and it's the prayers and spiritual life of Israel because this is how Israel truly should be. Number six, you see the tables of showbread. On these gold-plated tables you find in 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 48, of course, were the kiddish and the bread, symbolizing, of course, what we would know that Yahushua would come in with his body and with his blood. And then, of course, now we find number seven, you find the menorah, the lampstands, 1 Kings chapter 7 again. Their total number was 10 stands, 10 menorahs, and 77 stems, which brings 70 lights, of course, relating to not only the 70 Israelites of Exodus chapter 1, Jacob's offspring, depending on whether you're reading the Septuagint or the Masoretic text, we'll give you 75. This is national Israel as they become what? You're supposed to be that light unto the world, aren't we? We're supposed to be a light unto the 70 nations. And how do we do that? 
by keeping the Shabbat, by not going and doing all of their pagan holidays and saying, no, we don't do that. We're going to Sukkot. We're going to celebrate the Passover. Sorry, I know the family gatherings, all that, and I love you, but I can't be a part of that anymore because I've been called on to a higher purpose. That's not to diminish you guys, but, you know, I don't want to be a part of that anymore. My life is transformed, and I need to bear witness to the Bible, not bear witness to Hallmark any longer. See, our life is transformed. Look at number eight. Look at the porch. This is the portico, the vestibule. This was the antechamber or the ulam, First Kings chapter 6, verse 3, and Second Chronicles chapter 3, verse 4. This corresponds to the human hips, the pelvis. This is, of course, where there would be procreation through male and female organs. This, of course, is the procreation of the family of Israel, the blessings, the increase of seed, multiplicity. And number nine, we find, of course, the priestly cells, south and north sides. These are those arms, are they not? The high priest there, the entrances, First Kings chapter 6, verse 8, in the 41st chapter of Ezekiel, you find it. This corresponds to the onyx stones the high priest wore on his left and right shoulders. Of course, the Shochim, and each was engraved with the name of six, twelve, six tribes, twelve tribes of Israel in all. We find that in Exodus chapter 28. This is all laid out in the temple. Look at number 10. You've got the ten lavers. Five bronze water lavers were on the north and five on the south side by the porch. These signify the ten fingers of the hands. The lavers were for the washing of the blood off of the sacrificial offerings. And again, now we move down to number 11. We see the large bronze pillars, Yachin and Boaz, the pillars by the porch. And we see that in Second Chronicles chapter 3, verse 17. And these form his lovely legs. Look at those. These are the two hybrid symbolizing King David and Solomon. Is there war? Is there peace? This is what we see in the walk of Temple Man. Number 12, you see the Sea of Bronze and the 12 Bulls. This was a huge basin that was full of water for the Kohanim, the priests, to wash their hands, to wash their feet. Second Chronicles chapter 4, verse 2. And of course, this depicts the 12 tribes of Israel when we cross the Red Sea, 1 Corinthians 10, and its water symbolizes what? Yahweh taking us out of Egypt and bringing us into this full biblical shalom that's going to come upon you, the temple of the living Elohim. It was already foreordained. He knew from the beginning that it would end up with a bunch of people in the exile coming in through Yahusha and going, wow, I want full biblical shalom, full biblical health. Because ultimately, number 12, we know Yahusha did the work at the sacrificial altar. He did it up on the altar outside of the gates, which they that still want to go to the altar in the city gates, they have no right to eat of. Hebrews tells us that. Of course, number 13, the sacrificial altar. This forms temple man's feet. And it also symbolizes, as we'll see next, the metallic King Messiah's feet and footstool because this was the custom of that time. Now, as we go further looking into this, Carol said this yesterday, and I want to talk about this when we're talking about the temple, and ultimately it's about marriage because Yahuwah from the very beginning has always wanted to bring what? A bride into his house to create a family. And think about this from the very beginning. Yahuwah has always done this from the beginning. You see this picture all the way through. Carol brought this up yesterday. And boom, man, it impacted me and impacted Tamara. Yahuwah always takes one, begins with one. There was a man taken out of the dust, and then out of the one, he makes two, and out of the man became man, and he formed woman, and then out of the two, 
He brings full restoration and brings them back into one as Besar Echad, one flesh. Think about Israel. Israel is one house. He makes the one. But then there is a split of the kingdom, north and south. And then Yahushua comes in to regather the lost sheep of the house of Israel back into one. There is one Torah. And then there's the golden calf breach. And there's two. There's the book of the law now added for transgression, and the book of the covenant. And then Yahushua dies and resurrects, and he brings us back into one covenant Torah. It's the royal Torah. It's the book of the covenant. It's Malkit Yahweh always does this. You've got one Torah, two Torahs, one Torah. You've got one, you've got two, you've got one, one, two, one, one, two, one. This is Yahweh's plan. It is written from the beginning. You and I are on the right track. We're in the one book of the covenant Torah. We are in the one priesthood under the order of Melchizedek. And we are going back into full biblical health in our marriages, Besar Echad, in our families. That's the life that he has for us. I am so blessed and excited to be a part of this. And you guys need to realize that you're recipients of this. Don't get down on yourself. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a chosen generation that you can see this. Look at the disparity within Christianity. It's no longer Wesleyan reform theology that was the balance in the 18th and 19th centuries. Now you've got noodles on the left, Christian Zionism and evan evangelical Christianity going lawless into paganism more and more and more. Fornication in the pews on Sundays. I mean, they allow it in. They don't call it out. And then on the other side, you've got the Messianic movement and the Hebrew Roots movement where everybody and their mothers divorced, broken homes, broken marriages. How many wives have you had? I mean, my goodness. And they're all trekking up to the Temple Mount looking at the natural Animal flesh, blood, water, guts. And he says, there is more. You guys are missing it. It's been there from the beginning. One, two, one. One, two, one. One, two, one. Adam and Eve, they were joined together. They became that Besar Echad, that one flesh. That is the Holy of Holies. And the holy place of the same way joined together. And they become one house by a marriage covenant too. The very book of the covenant which is kept inside the ark of the covenant that's kept inside the Holy of Holies. He brings those that were outside. He enables us. To come in. I am so excited for Sukkot. To see all these people and hear all these stories of reunification. Then the ark with its contents, of course, was posted inside the Kadosh Ha Kedoshim, the Holy of Holies, which of course was the head, the mind, the face of Jacob. Temple man, the renewing of the mind daily. That's what we need to be doing. Because the tabernacle and the temple were designed as that marriage canopy, that hooper. And where did it happen? It happened in a book of the covenant context, Exodus chapter 19, verse 4, where this marriage tent between Yahuwah and his bride Israel, that was the one Torah. That was the one Torah that he had for them at the beginning. It was the book of the covenant, Exodus chapter 19, verse 4. Yahweh is the head. And what he says goes, even if we can't get our head around it. But finally we are because we got our heart around it first, didn't we? Because when my head was in religion and theology, I couldn't see it because I was an ultra-messianic. I had so much more knowledge than I do now. But now I have wisdom and discernment. 
It's different. It's totally different. It's to- I have a vision and clarity that I never had before. We were talking about that the other night. Wow. What a journey. What a journey. And many of you have traveled on that journey with me when I think about some of the things that we've done over the years. <laughs> You get your eardrums blasted out, tripping over people's seats, seats in the aisle, knocking each other out with the Torah scroll. I mean, my goodness gracious me, chasing after sheep with pen knives. I, we've done it all. And he still had his mercy upon us. <laughs> my goodness, what a strange, strange people. <laughs> Look at it, what it says. I love this. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. But I would have you to know that the head of every man is Messiah and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Messiah is Yahuwah. The Holy of Holies is that head. The holy place, of course, is that torso. And together they were meant to symbolize the one holy body through that book of the covenant marriage that happened at Mount Sinai all those years ago. The gate, of course, to the heaven is the golden door of the Holy of Holies and the stairway behind the golden doors corresponds to Jacob's ladder where this vision happened. Wow, the Holy of Holies, of course, depicts the heavens while the holy place relates to the earth. And these are the two places, heaven and earth. They are the head and the body. And that's why we have to renew our mind and change what we're doing with our bodies and what we're putting in our bodies. Are you going to choose Yahweh's stairway or are you going to choose man's? Because if you choose man's, you'll end up in the European Union and Babel because they built a tower, which is what, you know, the European Union is a picture of. And this is what we see, the UN. And you see all that coming over here now. But the outward appearance, appearance of the temple is in fact reflected even in the high priest's wardrobe because the exterior of Solomon's temple was made from the brightest white limestone that you'd see in Jerusalem. You can still see that to this day. And as the sun sets in Jerusalem, there's nothing more magnificent than seeing that limestone. And it just turns into this orangey gold color doesn't it all across and that's I, I think it's still an ordinance within Jerusalem is that it has to be built and faced built and faced with that limestone it, it's something to see but their color corresponded to the high priest garments that were white that were worn once a year on Yom Kippur but during the rest of the year he wore the garments of gold of course and these correspond to the temple's golden interior but look now as we come and see the metallic messiah look at the metallic messiah because these metals of the tabernacle they correspond to Yahusha as the metallic messiah they reveal him because their type and order actually parallel those of King Nebuchadnezzar's metal statue which symbolizes a Hillary Clinton or an unholy secular messianic world ruler their interior of course of of the Holy of Holies, holy place and porch are made with gold plating. The furniture outside was made with bronze. So Messiah himself has a head and torso and pelvis, as you can see, of gold. But his hands, legs and feet are of bronze. But he's got the silver shoulders where the currency of man, he holds the government upon his shoulders. And if you go back into the Torah, the building blocks, those building boards that held up the tabernacle, which are you, they come together by the couplings of silver, which is the currency of man, which resides upon Yahusha's, Yahusha's, Shoulders, because the government is upon his shoulders. Or do you want the New World Order government on your neck? Right? Wrong. But that's what it's come down to. 
That's what it's come down to. And the Zionist conspiracy is the new world, new world order temple on your neck. And both disparities within Christianity are leading you both there by their own separate roads, but they intersect at the animal sacrifices, Zionism, and the state of Israel. Beware. Beware, because it's coming quick. And we have to be aware of these times and these religious, secular leaders within the Torah, Messianic movement, and within evangelical and Christian Zionism. But we can see that the interior of the Holy of Holies now and the furniture responding to these wonderful, wonderful things as we come down into the shoulders and the arms relate to the silver-plated walls or houses or buildings, those priestly cells that were found in First Chronicles chapter 29. Of course, Nebuchadnezzar's metal statue we can see from Daniel chapter 2, verses 1 onward. Specifically, if you focus in Daniel chapter 2, verse 31, you'll see that this statue of four metals has a head of gold, arms, a chest of silver, a belly and thigh of bronze. In chapter um, 2, verse 32 of Daniel, you see those legs of iron and the feet of iron fused with baked clay. And, of course, the clay counts as one with the iron so as to be made into four metals. And that is the deception. See, it's a counterfeit trying to bring itself in. And that's why this temple and you and I understanding our position and function within it is so important. Are you going to be looking to the natural? Are you going to be looking to the fleshly or are you going to have the spiritual vision and dream that Jacob had? Because that is going to ultimately lead you into the Malkitzedic priesthood and the book of the covenant reality that you and I and this ministry is all about. And just as man's rule is summed up in one man of various metals, so too Yahweh's forthcoming reign is portrayed by a single metallic messiah of three metals, the plurality and the majestic purity of Yahweh. And that's what makes me sleep at night. First Corinthians chapter six, verse 19. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Ruach, the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which you have from Yahweh, and you aren't your own anymore, for you were bought with a price, that currency of redemption. Therefore, bring glory to Yahweh, actually in your bodies, that's full shalom, and your spirit, which are from him. For you were bought with a currency of redemption, the body, the metal of the Messiah, going back to that metal Messiah. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 finishing up here now therefore you are no more no longer strangers and foreigners but you are now in that one commonwealth remember how we started full biblical health it is national it is sociological we come together at his sabbaths and his feasts what we put in our body and what we do with our bodies what we look at what we listen to what we touch what we smell and what we do with our nostrils be careful, because that's a giveaway. If you're on a yoga mat doing alternate nostril breathing with Hillary Clinton, going to Bohemia Grove, then we have problems. Come see the guy in the back. Marine One. Look what it says. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the Israelite saints, forming the household, the temple of Yahuwah, the house of Israel. The house of Israel was built upon the foundations of the apostles and the prophets and Yeshua, Yahushua, the Messiah himself, being that Rosh Pinar, that cornerstone in whom all the house is therefore joined together, grows into a holy temple in Yahuwah in whom you also are being built together as the temple of Elohim through his Holy Spirit. This is the days that we live in. 
why we were born in this generation? Why did Yahweh choose to bring you in at this generation? You could have been born in medieval times. You could have been in the great plagues. You could have been in the crusades. You could, who, who knows what? But he chose to put you in this generation to witness and testify to his truth in these days. We have a big work to do. And the biggest work I believe that we have is to disperse this message to the nations because the great disparity in the 21st century that has come upon what we used to know as Christianity. The truth and the safe place is always going to be with Yahusha, who is our Melchizedek high priest. If we look to him and if we go to that altar outside of the gates which they that are wanting to go to the one inside of the gate, they don't no right to eat of where we eat of. Keep you safe. This is a message for this time because we don't know what tomorrow will bring. We do know that the stars and the constellations and astronomy does testify to Revelation 12. What does that look like? I don't have all the answers, but I see the way things are progressing and I see the disparity and it alarms me. That's why I wanted to share this because this, I believe, puts us back in balance. Amen? Questions, comments, anybody at all whatsoever, great resources for you online if you want to dig in a little deeper. Nada. Abba, we thank you, Abba, for you are with us. And Abba, we know and we feel your very presence by your Ruach HaKodesh. We thank you, Abba, for choosing us, a people out of the nations for this time. And we ask, Abba, that you would now go and take this message and bring in the multitudes by your Ruach, your Holy Spirit, in Yahushua's mighty name. Amen. Amen. Amen.